I've worked with a, a stepmom who has been in three tours of duty. She says, being a stepmom is harder than that. I've worked with women with cancer. This is harder than that. Welcome to the Most Days Show. The mission of Most Days is to measurably increase quality of life globally by helping people change their lives. This show is devoted to understanding how change happens. Today, we speak with Mary Kelly about step families. Mary, who I also know as mom, she, she's my mother, is a seasoned psychotherapist that's got, who's got over two decades of expertise specializing in empowering women and their partners in navigating the complexity of dating, cohabitating, and partnering. She's got a global reach and she's an amazing expert. It was fun to do a show with mom. I really, she's, she's a deep expert on this topic. She's been through a divorce. I am divorced. And so it was a personal conversation, but I think it sheds a light on something that we all interact with, which is step families or blended families. That's a term she doesn't like, as you'll see. But I think mom's awesome and she's a great guest. I hope you enjoy. Mary Kelly, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. I don't normally call you Mary Kelly. You are, you are my mother but you are also an expert on step families and blended families. You run the connection sessions on most days. And so I'm excited to dive into everything step family and blended family today. Can you share a little bit about your background and how you, how you came to focus on this? Yeah. Again, thanks so much for having me because, um, there's a lot of misconceptions about step families and how they operate and you don't see a lot of it depicted. Um, for example, like in Hollywood right now, there are more people living outside of living alone, families living outside of marriage and then remarriage than there are nuclear families. But you don't really see that um, in Hollywood, which is ironic because most of those people are on at least their second marriage or so. And so there is this, notion that the nuclear family is the main family, and that's just not true. Um, one out of four people um, are involved in some kind of step family system. So um, I'm a marriage and family system, uh, marriage and family therapist operating out of Boulder, Colorado, but I have been specializing in working with stepmoms and women who are dating, living with, or partnered with one who has children, whether they have their own or not. And I work with step, I work with their husbands or partners. So I work with divorced men who are repartnered. And then sometimes I work with stepkids or the whole family. So I've been doing this for over 20 years and I've been writing about it for a long time. So I contribute monthly to um, an online magazine called Stepmom Magazine. I've been doing that for about 14 years monthly. And then I'm a contributor on Huffington Post and and just to give you a brief idea of just the need, I started a meetup group in Boulder for women in the Boulder, Denver area who were looking for support about 14 years ago. And currently I have over 850 members. This is significant in a non-formally significant way of the type of support that stepmoms um, face because if I were to go up to 10 people on the street and say, first word you think of when I say stepmom, they're likely to say evil, wicked. And so there's there's a lot of stereotypes attached to stepmothers, much more so than stepfathers. So they just need a lot of support. It's um, many of them don't have children of their own, so they're joining a ready-made family. And so I started realizing um, over 20 years ago, there's not really a great support system for them. And so I started specializing in it. So I get to work with people really all over the globe um, because these problems are and challenges that come up are pretty universal. And how much of the work in, you know, I don't know that I've ever asked you this, but how much of your focus on this was informed from your own experience? And so, you know, mom and dad in the context of me are divorced, you divorced dad, you know, I, I, was, I was 14 or 15. And so how much is related to your own experience with divorce and starting, you know, a new or how much of it is just related because you, you know, you became a therapist prior to the divorce. And so how much of it do you think you'd be doing 
either way, you know, that you'd be doing even if, you know, you and dad had remained married, which is kind of a funny thing to think about. But how much is informed by that experience? Just I, for whatever reason, I, I'm not sure it had as much to do with the divorce because I was working with couples in first time marriages. And I just started getting clients who were in repartnerships or remarriage. And I was going, wow, these are not the types of problems that you encounter in, in a first marriage. And I'm just wondering what's out there because a lot of people, if they go to a therapist who doesn't specialize in this, they get first family solutions, which I quickly learned were kind of disastrous. So um, I just started doing a lot of reading and research to um, address those unique needs and started writing about them and really listening to these women and their, their experiences. Oh, so what you were seeing actually was, so I'm, so I'm also divorced, so okay. I'm divorced and remarried, and my wife and I, who now have a, a couple of kids, we go see a therapist to work on our relationship or whatever it might be, and the therapist is applying the solutions you would apply to a first marriage that doesn't have, you know, I've got my oldest daughter with my ex-wife. It doesn't have the complexity of the ex-wife and a child who isn't the daughter of the current wife. And so there's a whole lot of complexity there that just needs a different solution than, you know, what you might apply to a first family. I mean, that, that's what you were seeing. Yeah. And so some of the clients that I've worked with who've been to therapists who don't understand these complexities, stepmoms will be told, well, you, you know, you knew this was a package deal. And if they're struggling with some of the kids, um, or they're struggling with the ex, you knew this was a package deal, which I can tell you right now has never helped a single person to be told that really minimizes their feelings. A lot of women feel guilty. Why am I struggling with this? Or why am I, why am I happier when the kids leave than when they come, <laughs> which is actually a very normal feeling, but they work with therapists who say, well, you should love these kids and you should this and you should that. And then a lot of the divorced men come in with these kind of fantasies. It's interesting to me because I find men to be pretty solution oriented. But in this case, they put a lot of expectations on their new partner and kind of want them to be like a combination of Mother Teresa and Mary Poppins. And she comes and sprinkles her fairy dust to clean up the mess that she had nothing to do with making or to use their new partner as a buffer with the ex-wife. So there's a lot of pressure and expectations put on women that they're not, they didn't really know until they start experiencing it. There's a 62 to 74% divorce rate in remarriages with kids. And I think some of that is because of these unrealistic expectations that are put on the women that join these families. And it takes an average of four to six years, typically for people to feel even somewhat comfortable with each other because you're creating a family that has at least one member that's not biologically related. And that makes a big difference. Yeah. So in the context of stepmoms, you have, okay, dad is divorced from first wife. Dad and first wife had one or more children. That relationship ends dad starts new relationship with somebody who becomes stepmom and the unrealistic i mean I, I can you know i know this complexity firsthand although i feel pretty grateful for my experience but I, I i think i can speak to some of the areas where there's complexity and maybe we talk through them so one is dads have a lot of guilt i think that complicates things as one of many things i know for myself when a marriage doesn't work you, you know, first, the reality is, is that in my case, I'm, I'm seeing my daughter half of the time. And so there's a lot of grief associated with that. That's the thing I hadn't realized prior to being divorced is how much you lose, you know, mm -hmm. so we got divorced and my daughter was about two. And so I've lost eight years of her childhood. So I take, you know, 18 minus two divided yeah. by two. And there's a lot of grief associated with that. And I think with the grief, and maybe it's hard to pull apart, is the guilt. 
hey, I'm screwing her up. You know, this is, you know, like we've made a mistake here, whatever. And you feel really guilty. So maybe we start there. What role does the guilt or the mm. grief of dad in this situation play in making everything more complicated? Well, first I want to say you are so far ahead of 99% of the men that I work with. Because when I first meet with men, I want to talk to them about two things, their guilt and their shame. And, and I want to introduce grief because grief is not a thing that our culture is really good at helping people recognize and express. And it's a, it's a big loss. And you're right. When people are going through divorce, they're looking at they're unhappy with their partner and so they're not thinking about, oh, shoot, this means I'm losing 50% of my time with my kids. And, and men don't get together for a beer and say, how's your grief going? How's your guilt and shame going? And I think the guilt and shame is quite primal because I think, um, and, and I'm a big fan of evolutionary psychology, I think that a lot of men are hardwired. They want to protect and provide for their families. And for whatever the reason is, and many times it's, it's not, they had nothing to do with it. They feel this underlying guilt and shame for not providing a home for their children where there's a mommy and a daddy. And because so many of them aren't even aware of it, it's one of the first things I bring up when I meet them. I'll just say, hey, you know, I don't know if you're like a lot of the men I work with, but they have this underlying feeling of guilt and shame. And, and without exception, unless they've worked through it or they've recognized it, they'll say, well, yes, I feel, yes, I have horrible guilt and shame. And then how that correlates to is to the fact that divorced men are more prone to being permissive parents. And I think it steps from, stems from the guilt and shame. And that's a process of either forgiving themselves or accepting, um, some men were married to women that were um, just had huge mental health issues. Very difficult is just to say, hey, you weren't psychic when you married this person. And so that's where the grief comes in, to just grieve that you, for these fathers, that they weren't able to provide that for their children. And then you can give tools to your kids because often people don't talk to the kids like, hey, this is a grief. You lost having mom and dad in the house. And then um, kids usually get a certain amount of time with their divorced parents, and then a new partner comes in. This is another loss for the kids, right? So it's just being very aware of it so you can work with your own grief and your own shame. The shame is really unproductive because it usually leads to permissive parenting. And, and the other reason is, like you said, you have 50% of your time with your kids. A lot of men don't want to spend it being disciplinarians. And, and so it's also helping men see you don't want the permissiveness or you don't want the guilt and the shame to be the thing that instructs you on how to parent. You don't want those mixed up. You want to separate those because you want to be parenting your kids rather than being really permissive. And it's another thing that causes problems because women come into the relationship and they're in their house and they're like, this is like animal house. Like what is going on here? And what are the rules? What are the consequences? And there aren't any. So that causes a lot of problems with the couple. So I work on that as well a lot too. And then they have, I think because of this guilt and shame, they look at their new partner often thinking, well, she's even better than their mom. And so they put all this pressure on them. And for kids, the more dysfunction there is for with a mother, the higher the loyalty bind will be. And children have an automatic loyalty bind to their parents anyway. And so part of the work for men, too, is to let go of a lot of the expectations and pressures that they're putting on their new partner especially since the kid's not accepting it anyway. 80% of young adult stepkids would say that they don't feel close to their stepmother. This does not mean they dislike them. They just, they're not their person. And this is where the biological and the primal forces really come into play. So I, I'm honestly not even a fan of the term stepmom 
because it automatically gives the kids something to resist because of their loyalty to their own mother and also because they're not their mother. If you look at the definition in Webster's Dictionary, a stepmother is defined as a woman who marries a man with children or marries someone with children. That's all. It doesn't imply being a mother. So a lot of women struggle with what is my role? What am I supposed to do? And, you know, they're knocking themselves out, almost kind of reverting to these 1950 stereotypes of women. And, and then they hit a wall eventually because it's often not welcomed by the kids. So if, if you separate each thing out and you can help people understand and see this, then you're not gonna experience that high divorce rate. Just a really quick break to invite you to Most Days. Most Days is an app that uses behavioral psychology to help people change their lives. It's available on the App Store and very soon on Android. Hope you'll join us. Just on the the guilt and shame, I mean, yeah, I feel grief more. And the thing that's been surprising to me is that the grief doesn't go away. You don't get used to it. I had expected, I'm now five years out, and I had thought, oh, there's an adjustment period and then you're going to get used to this. But half the nights, you know, my daughter's bed is empty and that you know, that person who fills up the house with so much life, you know, she's not there. Um, she's somewhere else. And so that sadness and that grief and the, the realization of what you're missing, it doesn't go away. It just, it's, it, you're constantly reminded of it. And I think there's the second layer, which is feeling the grief for my ex-wife, you know, knowing that she is also experiencing that half the time and really feeling for her. And in some way, you know, that's a shared experience. It's, you know, it's not a good experience, but we both have to go through that. And then the second piece, I think, from my, my own experience that, I, that I'd like to touch on, and I think we're getting there, is a little bit of the role of maybe we start with the ex-wife, I feel very grateful and more grateful than ever, having now been in this experience, that my daughter has a great mom and I think very highly of my ex-wife. So I don't, she wouldn't want me talking about her too much here, but I feel really lucky in who she is and the co-parenting relationship that we have. And it makes me even more cognizant of how much more complicated an already complicated situation would be if we didn't have a good co-parenting relationship or if she was just a more complicated personality than she is. And so how much does the relationship between dad and, I mean, it matters a lot, but how do you think about that relationship and where it breaks down and what the role of it is in, in creating a healthy blended dynamic. First, I'm just going to quickly say I'm not a fan of the term blended family. Um, just because I, I've worked with so many people and the first time I work with them, they're like, we're not blending and we're failures. And I'm like, you know what, the problem is with the word blended, who came up with that? I, you know, it, it's an expectation. And, and it's also kind of creepy. Oh, we're going to just throw everyone in a blender and even people that aren't related to each other. And we're just going to be one smooth thing. That's not even a first family. I, I think language can be important as far as how it affects one's emotions. So I try to help people like, get rid of the blended thing. We call first families families. We don't call them happy families. We don't call them together families. They're just families. If you were to call a step family anything, call it a lumpy family, but that could apply to first families too. So I, I like to get rid of the things that are causing people guilt, right? So one of the first questions I ask the dad is, tell me about your relationship with your ex. If he says hostile, there's court, I go, okay, well, <laughs> you guys better put on your seatbelts and you've got to create a lot of boundaries. Um, 
typically if if there's court involved and there's constant things or they're getting 20 texts a day and 20 emails a day, there's more than likely um, a personality disorder with the ex-wife. And so it's working primarily with the fathers um, to establish really clear boundaries. And they can't co-parent because anytime they suggest anything, their ex-wife is like, no, 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 I'm not going to let the kids be in therapy. No, I'm not. And it's kind of heartbreaking to work in these situations. And I experience it way too often than I would prefer because it renders a lot of these fathers quite powerless. They can't control that other situation. And so it's about having really clear boundaries. And um, that's why the term parallel parenting is used a lot because it's a lot of divorced people don't co-parent that well, whether there's a personality disorder or not. And obviously, the more alike the household rules are in each house is better for the kid. But kids can also learn to make adjustments between each home. Oh, at this home, I can watch, I, I can be on my iPad all I want. At this home, I've got restrictions and they can make those adjustments. And sometimes you just have to accept the reality of the situation, which is, you're divorced, you can't control this person. And so that just means they need to have really clear boundaries to protect the privacy as much as they can in the home. Although, frankly, privacy is a really difficult thing to have in a step family. And this can make people, especially um, the one stepmoms when they're not biologically related because they may go to their moms and get peppered with a lot of questions and, and it's really trying to teach kids the difference between privacy and secrets. Let's keep let's keep our home private and what goes on in this home stays in this home. And then secrets are things that are unhealthy for children to keep. And so you want to make those distinction with your kids, but it's really hard. It's hard to control. So that becomes problematic as well. Yeah. And, and I think as a if you're in the situation, you have to stop yourself from asking certain questions. I mean, I think that's where it's easiest to go. You're like curious about what's happening, but you know, in your head, this is irrelevant. I'm curious, you know, it's the same little tickle bone that tickles when you hear gossip or something. And you just have to not ask the question because it's inappropriate. And you have to realize that you just, you just don't want to go there. Um, but I like what you're saying. It's been refreshing for me and having, you know, and, and obviously talking to you about this in the past, which is, hey, it, you don't need a some perfect co-parenting relationship. That's great if you're communicating well and you're really coordinated, but it doesn't have to be that way. And if it's not that way, that's okay. The, the kids will adapt yes. and it's not the end of the world. That's right. And there's some flexibility there. I think probably particularly in the beginning, you know, there's obviously more tension right when the relationship has dissolved and there's some figuring out, okay, how are we working together? There's some anger and it's like, okay, just give it some time. It can be a little parallel, it can be parallel for a little bit and you'll figure out what that default operating mode is over time um, and just do your best on your side to be the best right. parent you can be. And, you know, you can't well, and focus it. on the kid too, because sometimes I'm working with fathers where um, there's a thing called parental alienation syndrome. It's not really recognized by the DSM as any kind of formal diagnosis, but judges are very aware of it, that there are parents and this may happen with fathers. It's just that that's not the population I work with, but they're saying terrible things to their kids about the other person. And, you know, I work with men and they're trying to argue with these exes and trying to convince them, but they're dealing with people they're not going to change. And I'm just like, forget about it. Focus on your relationship with your kid. Focus on it. If they bring up something like, mommy said you won't pay for anything and you're actually paying for everything, it's fine to say, oh, I, I don't know why she's saying that. I'm not sure why, but of course I pay for things. And then refocus on your relationship with the kid. But Mothers can be very powerful systems, and sometimes 
they were successful in doing this and that's kind of a whole different subject, but it's, it's part of what happens. Um, men tend to repartner within a year or two after divorce and women take four to six years. It's another question I ask, is your ex repartnered? If they say no, it's quite common that they're much more intrusive as far as being intrusive about their new home with their new partner. Um, and I've also found out in my work with stepmoms, I, I've, I'm just gonna be honest here, I've never seen such viciousness of women against women. 99% of the women I work with, I'll go, oh, what's the ex life? She's crazy. She cheated. I mean, it's like, okay, I don't think this is statistically supported. <laughs> and I just say, you know, I have a feeling if I talked to ex-wives, they'd say that you were crazy. So maybe you could evolve past that, but there's a lot of, and, and I think there's a primal competition that happens with women. Uh, we used to have to compete with each other for our very survival back in the day, but women can evolve past that. So that's another tricky part of these relationships. If those women feel like, oh, my, my husband is talking to his ex too much, he's texting her, he's sharing personal things, then that's something that has to be addressed. And it really should be kept to just pretty logistical things when you're in a new relationship. But the ex-wives can be triggered when their partner, when their ex repartners because it's threatening to have another woman suddenly enter your children's life. And that's another grief. And it's, um, it's scary. It can be scary. Oh, what if they like them better, which doesn't happen, but that's a fear. And so that's another complicated dynamic that comes into play. You know, there can be so much anger and pain associated with the dissolution of a marriage. And it's so easy to fall into okay, I'm the good guy and he or she is the bad guy. Yeah. And you filter everything through that lens. So some innocuous thing that ex-husband or ex-wife does gets filtered through this bias of the worst possible interpretation of it, which makes it much worse. And so it's very easy to do this good guy, bad guy narrative, but at least what's been helpful for me, and I think this is true just generally in terms of disagreements that you have even outside, it, which is both people are good people who are doing their best. It's the combination of the two things that is the thing that's not working. Let's vilify the combo. We're both a part of it. Let's try not to vilify the other person. So it's much easier said than done. You know, the, you know, the, the good guy, bad guy narrative is easy to fall into. But it often is like, you're both good guys, you're both bad guys. It's a really complicated situation and everybody's, I think in most cases, doing their best. I mean, I'm sure you see you see the opposite, but it's helpful for me to remind well, myself. I see of, that plenty of times. Um, I do think it takes a certain amount of emotional intelligence to be able to see what you're saying or a certain level of time to get to that or... Um, some of these women just saying, I need to see every text, I need to see every email, which is a really terrible idea because as women, we're kind of hardwired to ruminate and it just, it goes down a rabbit hole. And most men really would prefer not to do that, but they're trying to be open with their wife. So I kind of come in and go, don't do that. I mean, it's, it's hard. You can get something in your head. You don't want to go there. And um, to just let the guy you know, it has to be an appropriate amount of, of interchanges, exchanges, I mean. So you just have to, again, it's a boundary thing, but what happens is a lot of couples also spend a lot of time talking about the ex. And so it's something I ask people like, hey, uh, how often are you talking about the ex? And I had one couple, they were like, uh, 15 hours a week. Now, this is a highly conflictual situation of multiple court hearings and everybody had money so they could be in court forever. And I was like, well, you should just have her move in with you. And, you know, I'm pretty sure that when you guys fell in love, your common thing that you were talking about wasn't the ex. You have attorneys, let the attorneys do it. But there's some kind of like this morbid attraction of sitting there and complaining about the ex kind of like when you see a car accident on the side of the road and you're like, I'm not going to look, I'm not going to look. And then you're looking, it's like, oh, 
Why did I look? Now that's on my head. I really work with people. They'll have terrible ringtones for the ex, like barking dogs or a witch sound. And it's like, stop. You know, you really have to discipline yourself to limit your time talking about the ex because it's not, it's not sexy. It's not fun. And it's not the thing that, that drew you together. Yeah. And there's also, there's a whole bunch of talking about the ex that is just required. So when you have kids, it's, it's a lot of logistics. Okay. What are we doing for summer camp? Who's picking up? Who's dropping? What, when, when does the doctor appoint, appointment happen? All of that is in, you know, first families, there's a lot of logistics. And then you're adding this layer where you're coordinating, okay, whose day is it? And somebody's traveling. So we're switching days and who can handle the doctor appointment or the day off of school. There's just a lot of logistics. And I know, you know, for my own, in my own situation, I, I just think this is, this is probably a general experience. There is a lot of coordinating. Like, so I've got my wife and we're coordinating. We've got our own calendar. And then I'm coordinating with my ex-wife on the activities of the daughter. And I'm updating, you know, my ex-wife on the activities of, of the, you know, the, my older daughter with, the, with, with my first wife. And there's just a lot that you can't escape. And so you want to limit it that. Like, you, there's just a lot of talking about what day of the week, what time, who's doing what. And... That's just, there's just a lot of logistics. And so it does feel, feels good to limit that as much as possible. You don't need to talk, talk about it more than you're already going to need to just to make everything flow. Right. Because it just, I think it just tr brings up these primal kind of triggers. It's hard to talk about. What communication do you both need to have together? What can you just deal with, with your ex? that doesn't interfere with your time with your wife and to just be sensitive to that. And yeah, and then be careful because it's easy to slip into kind of complaining or doing the vilifying. And it's just, it's not energy that you want to spend. What do you think about the role that stepmoms should play? So you've commented on, you don't like the word stepmom or stepmother because it implies that that person is a mom or a mother and they're not. My only pushback on that would be it's just the term that gets used around the kids. You know, it's the term and so it's not a perfect term but it's the one that's being used and you're you know, you're you're swimming against the exactly. current if you're trying to change it. And so but what how should stepmoms think about their role in the lives of dad's kid, their partner's kids? Yeah. Well, first I want to say I have worked with some um, men whose kids were very, um, really resistant to the new, to the new wife. And I said, I want you to try something. I want you to go tell them, look, you didn't have any choice about your parents getting divorced. You didn't have any choice about who I chose or who you consider family. You don't have to, like her, love her, or even accept her as part of the family. But in this home, we're going to be kind. We're going to act in kind and loving ways. And here's what we do know. You can tell people, this is my dad's wife. Everybody knows what dad's wife means. What we don't understand is stepmom automatically has a negative reaction that's very prevalent. Oh, they must be evil. They must be this or that. Stepdad takes Johnny to the soccer game. Look at that guy. He's such a great guy. He's taking Johnny to the soccer game. Susie takes Johnny to the soccer game. It's either who does she think she is or she's being intrusive. If I'm sitting with a group of mothers and we're going, oh, summer break starting. We are not looking forward to the kids coming home. They're going to wreck the house. Everyone's agreeing with each other. Stepmom says, Oh, I know. I feel the same way. It's going to stop the conversation. So it's really important to acknowledge for women who partner with, with men with kids, especially those that don't have their own. It's an incredibly lonely experience. And then added on to this, going back to your question, what is the role that stepmom should have? You know, I, I'm not a fan of the word should, so that's not a word that I would ever use. I get asked this a lot by the women that I work with. 
And my response is, your role is to be yourself. Be organically yourself. You're not their mother. Cause no harm. Cause no harm to these kids. Treat them in kind and loving ways. I don't care what your feelings are. Your feelings are your personal business. Because I've worked with a lot of people. Some of these kids would be really hard to even like. So you got to kind of go above that. Act in kind and loving ways. And I tell men, hey, just FYI, she's with you despite the fact that you have kids. Not because you have kids. No woman grows up going, oh, I really hope I fall in love with a guy with an ex and kids. That would be my dream. And actually, their favorite day is probably the day your kids leave. And your favorite day is the day they come because then you can feel like, oh, this kind of feels like a nuclear family. I feel good. I'm not feeling guilty today. And it's okay. No, but just accept that you each ha may have these different feelings, right? And understand that stepmoms do not get the support that kids get, that fathers get. They're, they're very, you know, people go, oh, it's Disney's fault. It goes way back. It goes back to for as long as they're, you know, been stepmoms. And it's, it's one of these isms that I think still exists, like this stepmom ism, an automatic bias towards these women, which is why it can be such a lonely experience. And they have to be careful who they talk to, because if they go, oh, this is really hard, like his kids are coming now. Well, you knew it was package deal. It's such a complicated position to be in. And I think it goes all, it goes, it cuts a bunch of different ways. I was really surprised during my halftime single dad days. And I'm sure, you know, there's a, there's some version of this for, for single moms, how hard it was to coordinate so much of the world of the kids like it happens through the moms. The moms really control the flow of information and the schedules and the play dates. And when you are not partnered, but you're at, trying to advocate on behalf of your kid as a, as a single dad, first off, it's just the, the awkwardness of, okay, you are texting other people's wives and you are single and you know, they are not. And so there's, there's that piece of it. Mm -hmm. And then uh, at least I found it, it was a little harder to get into the group. I wasn't really a member. I think there is some concern of, I don't know, you know, having a daughter, I don't know. I'm going to send my dad over to like that. I'm going to send my daughter over to the single dad's house. And so there's so much complexity. I'm, I, you know, single, I don't have the experience of course of single mom. I have a little bit of the experience of the halftime single dad and then seeing, you know, it seems maybe the most complicated, and we shouldn't compare, the stepmom situation is very complicated. But you're right. You're right about as the single dad, you're getting judged or stereotyped or whatever, like, oh, the, we're not, we don't know about him and his house. And whereas they're more likely to feel comfortable with the divorced mom's house. Yeah. And then I get some of that. I think in the sense of if my daughter is going over a play date with a, I don't know, a bachelor dad or something, it's a little bit, it, there's a little bit more like mm, something could go wrong than there is with the going over with mom, you know, somebody and their mom, you know, a friend and their mom. And so I get it, but yeah, it's a comp it's complicated. I hadn't realized how much just like the moms control everything. And if you're not in with the mom, you would think the mom cabal, it's harder to advocate for your kids. So I know I'm veering off of uh, but I, step you're families. Speaking to something that I said earlier is I think mothers are really powerful systems and dysfunctional mothers, unfortunately can be really powerful. And, and that's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking um, because these guys cannot control what's going on in that home. But it's also being realistic of what am I up against here? And it's hard for stepmoms, you know, they go to these sporting events and there's the mommy club. And mom has been probably not saying very nice things. And that's a weird experience. And these poor women are like, I've never had this in my life. I mean, people generally like me and these kids are looking at me suspiciously and these mother mothers and it's really hard. I, 
it's an invitation for everybody to learn a bunch of really good stuff that as human beings, we do well to learn, whether it's like setting boundaries and letting go of what other people think of you and focusing on the things that are important. This is a, I I remember doing a radio interview with this Canadian station a while ago and I'm giving him all these statistics and stuff. And he goes, is there anything good about being part of a step family? (laughs) You know, there's a little bit of airtime there. And I said, you know what? We don't learn as human beings unless it's difficult, that there's a difficult lesson or there's a painful experience. That's the invitation because behind anything difficult or underneath it is a lesson that's so valuable that we can be thankful for the difficulty. And so for everything that I'm describing, we haven't talked about what it's like for kids to transition back and forth and back and forth, these transition days. Those are always hard. They're always gonna be a transition. You talked about that grief. Grief is not linear and that's what you've experienced. Grief is something that we learn to walk with and allow ourselves to feel, but not get stuck in. So I just wanted to make sure that I said that. So now moving on to the relationship between the ex-wife and the stepmom, wherever you wanna start there, what are the common pitfalls? What do you recommend that relationship looks like? What are, you know, how how do you think about a healthy dynamic there? I don't think there's any big reason, unless it's some kind of natural thing, that there is any kind of relationship between an ex-wife and a new wife, other than if you see them at something, that you're cordial to each other. So it's, it's, it's as simple as that. It's, hey, there's not a relationship and... You know, you're cordial you when you see not, each other. And I'm just going to be really blunt. It's hard to have a friendship with someone else and you know that you both slept with the same guy. It's kind of like, come on. I mean, there's that is part of it in there. And so it's always going to feel a little bit weird. It's going to feel a little bit Twilight Zone ish. So I don't think the last thing with all the complications, definitely. Oh, and not only that, you got to be kind of friends with the ex. It's like, no, no, you don't. You just need to be adults when you're around each other. That's it. If something else naturally comes from that, I don't know. I'm just, I caution people. You've got enough to worry about in this new relationship and keeping that healthy. A lot of times women get over-involved and they're part of these group texts or they're, they're texting with the ex. I just see it backfire so many times. It doesn't seem to last. And I, I think it's because it's kind of a big ask. And it's an unnecessary ask. So little to no relationship. It's it's cordial. There's some small amount of coordinating that has to happen. That's just simply required for whatever's happening. Okay, fine. But no no expectation that there that there is any kind of real relationship. Well, if it if if there's some natural way that that happens, you know, in an ideal world, there would be um, let's say mom's repartner. There'd be four adults like true adults, they might say, hey, let's do the birthday parties together. Let's get together occasionally. You know, let's do something after this. If people can do that, it's just really, really rare. And so if that type of thing happens, it happens just from a very organic place, not a should place. Oh, we have to do this. And I would say that's more on the rare side, but if it happens, awesome. I think I was telling you and Christiana about this um, couple that got divorced and they had two little kids and then everybody repartnered. They live in this, I don't know what I feel about this, but they've lived successfully for like eight years in this big old house, which is so awesome because they get to see their kids every day and it works, but that is so rare. And it's nothing that I would ever say, you should aspire to do this. So you know, I wouldn't rule anything out, obviously, if it happens very organically, which can happen. It's just rare. So don't don't put pressure where it doesn't need to be. And then there's this high divorce rate for second marriages where there are kids from the first marriage. I mean, it seems like probably the, the divorce rate is high no matter what, but it's particularly high in second marriages where there are kids 
Well, and the higher end is when both people bring kids in. If you've been married, if you're in a second marriage for like five years, it's really like dog years. Yeah, you get to add on a lot more years because when when people repartner, especially a woman that's never been married and it's her first marriage, she she loses the whole couple of years before there's kids, a couple of anything, right? She just mack in that. So they have to work. They're like, this is the hardest thing. I I have I've worked with a, a stepmom who has been in three tours of duty. She says being a stepmom is harder than that. I've worked with women with cancer. This is harder than that. I just saw on a Instagram thing today they were saying, um, "Is it getting any easier?" And women are like. Uh, no, 12 years in, not easier. No, no, no. Wouldn't recommend it to anybody. <laughs> but they're not leaving. So um, it's hard, you know, but if you can accept the difficulty, it gets less hard. And and what percentage of the, you know, I mean, we don't have to put an exact number on it, but how impactful, the, I guess the question I want to ask that we don't, that we're not going to have the data on is what percentage of divorces are due to all of the complexity of the blended family? I know we don't like that term, but of the but complexity of the, of the, of the, of the, of all of the second marriage and the kids from the first marriage. And what percentage of them do you think are just normal? They would have ended even if you didn't have the complexity of the of the second marriage, I think for the divorces that happen because of the step family, it's because of a lot of unrealistic expectations that they thought it was going to be so much easier. They're like, our love will conquer all, and they're not being realistic about it. And then it becomes difficult, and they become really disillusioned. Or if a husband is really insisting on these unrealistic expectations of their wives, or they're constantly they're always putting their kids first so that when they have their kids, I work with a lot of women that feel like they've been put on a back burner, that there's no attention to the relationship at all while they're there. That's not sustainable. Men do often feel quite powerless or they feel caught in the middle. I'm trying to please my kids. I'm trying to please my new wife. Nobody's happy. I'm not doing anything right. And I just go, you know, you're just in a tough position because you kind of are in the middle. You do have a responsibility as a parent for your children, and you have an equal responsibility to your wife in your marriage. So yeah, you've got a lot going on there. You're going to have to learn how to negotiate that. Sometimes kids are going to have to be more of a priority or the marriage is, but that gets really difficult. And if they're not able to do that, and especially for women are like, what am I doing here? You know, I can't integrate into this family. It's too hard. So I think what we've been talking about, if there's guilt, if there's really poor boundaries with the ex, if there's unreal expectations, if not, you still need to nurture the marriage and the relationship. Any marriage counselor is going to tell people you got to have date night. Now, I think in fairness to men, the week they have their kids, try to spend some time during the day where you can connect to one another. It's really hard to do a date night when you've already lost 50%, but make sure you're doing it that other time. And then every once in a while, there are couples that I've worked with where they end up getting divorced because of infidelity or the other types of reasons that maybe it's financial things that most couple that a lot of couples encounter. And and also to say too, don't blame everything on the step family. Cause like a kid will be acting out. They're like, it's because of this, it's because of the divorce, it's because of this family and this. It's like, how about it's that you got a 14 year old with hormones? I, you know, let's not blame everything on divorce and the step family. Yeah, that is so hard not to do. You know, I think the guilt, the shame, when something isn't going well with the kid, it's it's just so easy to go to that place of, oh, you know, we're screwing her up. If we wouldn't, you know, if we weren't divorced, then things would have been better. And it's impossible to know what the counterfactual is. It's impossible to know, hey, would this have existed had we stayed married? And so you just get in 
this endless loop and you can't change it. But I think it's a continual work to not go to that place of guilt and shame because it's typically not productive. It's not helpful. So it's more like maybe maybe this is because of the divorce. Oh, well, you know, maybe a kid's mother dies when they're 10 and they have some problems. Yeah. OK. So it's not focusing on the problems as much as it's focusing on the solutions and the guilt can prevent you. You can kind of hit a wall, you know, if coulda, woulda, shoulda instead of, OK, yeah, maybe this is hard. Maybe I need to help my kid with a little more grief and, and have a lot of openness about that and ask them how they're feeling about this. Often people don't do that. They just expect kids to, oh, kids are resilient. They can go along with this. I would just encourage you and uh, any man that I'm working with, don't accept the guilt and shame because it's not your friend. It's not your ally. Well, and so much of this is, is grass is greener when I think the reality is it just makes everything more complicated. So in a first marriage, finding time for date night is hard. There's a bunch of logistics. You've got to make sure that you're communicating and you're staying on the same page and you're finding time for the kids and you're finding time for the relationship. In a second marriage, it's just more complicated. You're maintaining a relationship with the ex. You're main, you want to make, make sure you've got a healthy relationship with, with your current wife. You have less time with the kids. And so that complicates date night. The logistics are, are more complicated. And it's very easy to look at if we weren't in this situation, it'd be great. And it's, you know, both are hard. Raising kids is hard. Having a healthy marriage is hard. It's just harder it is. when it's a it's second hard. marriage. But the, the, the underlying issues, maybe with the exception of the stepmom, I mean, there are some, there are some issues that are unique to second marriages that, that don't exist in, in first marriages. But it's very easy to do that grass is greener thing. And I think to your point, it's not productive. What's the solution? How do we look forward? Let's not do the, let's not idealize the, the other path. Well, you know, as humans, we always idealize the choice we didn't make. It's always like, oh, if I had done this, I would have been this, this, and that instead of, hey, maybe if you'd done it, you would have been in the wrong place the wrong time and gotten killed by a drunk driver. I mean, we always, you know, so we make ourselves suffer a little bit more because we create this story of, well, if I had stayed, it would look like this or it would be like this. And it's, it's just not helpful. And I encourage people, I love the movie Apollo 13 because it's a real story that really happened. And talk about complications. These astronauts should never made it back to Earth. It was one after another, after another, after where they had to create solutions outside of the box. And I think that's where the solutions when I'm working with, with couples or stepmoms, let's think outside of the box, not the nuclear family box. And I loved it because the, the Ed Harris character, he was always like, work the problem, work the problem. This guy's going, oh my God, we've never encountered this before. We don't have this stuff. Figure it out, work the problem, think outside the box. I just think that's the best way to operate because we can spend hours ruminating all these problems. And it's like, stop, just look for solutions. That's the liberation, right? That's where you go. Well, thank you so much for being such a wonderful mother, first and oh, foremost. Well, thank you. Thanks for being... <laughs> An amazing son. And I almost feel guilty because your situation with you and your your wife and your ex and the kids, I'm like, damn, I never thought I I have to call them a blended family. I, I just don't get to experience it much in my practice. So it's it's just a really a wonderful honor to be related to you and everybody else and my grandchildren. I'm so lucky. But of the siblings, it's it's best to be related to me, you know. Well, um, it is. And, you know, you are my favorite, so. <laughs> but no, but, th I, you know, really, you you are a wonderful mother and I, I, I appreciate you so much. I appreciate everything you do for most days. And then, you know, thank you for your work more broadly. Having Having been through this, it's now so much clearer to me how important your your viewpoint on this is. There's a bunch of different ways to cut this up. There are a bunch of different ways to do it right. You don't need to put too much pressure on it. Let's stop vilifying stepmoms. So thank yes, you so much please. for your message. 
Thank you. Thank you so much for having me on. The Most Day Show is recorded in Boulder, Colorado, produced by Patrick Adino, music by Patrick Lee, and hosted by yours truly, Brent Franson, founder and CEO of Most Days. 